Shooting an original muzzle loading rifle is always fun. Shooting an over under percussion double rifle, now that's true delight. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Ball here, your favorite gun channel in beautiful, bright, hunglish language. And I have a beautiful and interesting gun for you today from the city of Walzers, the Blue Danube, from Vienna, from the middle of the 19th century. This gun is made by Karl Pirko, one of the most important gun makers of the age in the Austro-Hungarian area from 1867 Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Well, this rifle has some very interesting specialties. First of all, this is a double rifle with over and under bores, which is not really common in the 19th century. German call it the box system. Second, there is a very special rifling in the bores. The upper bore has a traditional spiral rifling, but with the same number of grooves and same depths of grooves, the bottom bore has a straight rifling. Let's see the story of this lady and let's see how it shoots, of course. But before we continue, let me thank you for your support, because your donations on Patreon are vital for keeping the quality of the channel high. Here you will find exclusive content from me, time by time. We are also present on the Forgotten Weapons and War platform, which is an excellent hiding place for gun nuts like us, with thousands of videos from educational creators. So, whichever you choose, that's a good support for us, and it's an important support for us. If you like what I do, then please share, like, comment, and also subscribe to the channel. This will help us grow because the search engines, they will not help grow any kind of gun-related channels. This is the first shooting session with the Pirco double rifle to 50 meters. The bore is 61 caliber, and by this time the closest bullet I had was the 575 round ball. The charge was 80 grains of 2F Swiss powder and as thick patch as possible. This group was anything but acceptable. This definitely meant that I will have to find a proper size bullet for my rifle. So many think that the box system was invented in the beginning of the 20th century and the box shotguns appeared and before that we don't find any kind of box rifles or shotguns. Well, this is not true because we know many wheel lock guns, flint lock guns, also percussion guns that has the box system. So this is not an invention of the 20th century. In fact, the Imperial Army of Austria already adopted an uh, over-under gun in the 18th century, which is behind me. 
So this is a model 1769 Doppler Stützen. It had an improved version during the French wars. It was the model 1795, but technically it was the same, just with the modernized, the French style lock. So this gun is quite special. It was considered a Jäger rifle, so it was, it was intended for special troops. It was intended for the sharpshooters of the Border Guard Infantry Regiments. Now, this gun has two bores in box system. The upper one is rifled, it is for accuracy, and the bottom is a smooth bore that is for high rate of fire. So the bottom bore was loaded with paper cartridges and the upper bore with patch round bore and loose powder. So upper bore served for accuracy and the bottom bore for rate of fire. So all the two important uh, things for musketry by that age was integrated into one gun. These guns were phased out during the French wars because they were too heavy and they were also too expensive. But the concept survived on the civilian market because for a hunter it still had many advantages. So having two instead of one shot in the age of the single shot guns, that's a great advantage. We are not in the age of the repeating rifles, let's not forget that ladies and gentlemen. So Karl Pirko was one of the most important gun makers who made several types of these over-under double rifles. Let's have a closer look to this beauty and let's learn its history. And I have a great help in here. Usually Cap and Ball is using not internet sources, but old-fashioned books. And I have a book about Car Pirco that was written by one of the members of the Black Powder shooting community, by my Italian friend Roberto Vecchi. That's an excellent monography that says a lot about Car Pirco and his guns. So I really suggest you and recommend you to buy this book. It's a good collection of the information that we have for Car Pirco. So, caro Roberto, mille grazie per il tuo aiuto e anche per il libro. Carl Pirko was born on 30 September 1803 and he finished his apprenticeship at a British gun maker. Unfortunately, we don't know his name. I'm pretty sure that we can search for that in archives because we are going to have some sources for that. But this is something that the family told to Roberto when he wrote the book. Uh, he, was, he became the member of the Viennese Gun Making Guild in 1831. And by that time, he was already making high quality, elegant weapons for elegant customers. He opened his workshop at Kaiserstrasse 1, near the cavalry barracks. This location was close to the border of the city. Today this road is called Josefstadterstrasse, and nor the cavalry barracks nor the original building of the gunsmith shop exists today. But he also had a flat in the, let's say, closer to the heart of the city. By these times he was already making guns for such important customers as the son of Bonaparte Napoleon and Marie Louise of Österreich. He was mainly an artisan gun maker and acknowledging his achievements in gun making, he became the member of the Association of Industrial Activities of Vienna in 1845. This was the time when Karl Pirko started to establish large-scale manufacturing as well. So in 1849 he registered a new trademark for his guns. This was C and P, two letters. This meant Karl Pirko, written with a C. This was used for military guns only. But also he kept his original name, Karl, written with K, Karl Pirko, as a full name, written on the guns, as the civilian trademark. In 1853 he moved his large-scale production out of the city. He purchased the forge in Kirchberg and der Pielach, 50 kilometers to the west from Vienna, in Lower Austria. It was a good location, as all the raw materials were available here. He bought an old forge here, that was called the Pielhammer. The buildings, by the way, are existing still today, so you can travel there and, and visit these buildings. One building was used for forging and one was used for finishing an assembly. Now, this location is quite good because there is very good quality coal here that is important for forging. Also, as I told you, the river is giving the energy to the plant and also we have wood, we have iron there. So, which means that it's just a perfect location for gun making. Just a few meters from these buildings you can find a cross, a wooden cross with a white corpus Christi on it, which is uh, called by the locals the Pirko Cross. It is standing between four mighty linden trees, but we don't really know exactly what it marked. According to Vecchi's book, there was a rumor among the locals in the 19th century that Karl Pirko was in fact a traitor because he sold guns during one of the wars in the middle of the 19th century to the enemy. Well, I'm not sure if the Prussians bought any kind of muzzle-loading guns from him. The French, well, they were not, needing, not in need of guns. Probably the South Piemontese kingdom during the war of 1859 could be a customer for Pirko, but I'm not really sure because, because uh, Karl Pirko kept on making military guns after these wars as well for the monarchy. But it is said by the locals that he was caught and he was not executed, of course, but the emperor forgave him. But from that time, 
he always wore a black band on his neck showing that he is a traitor. This is the second shooting session. The distance is 50 meter again, but I changed the bullet to a 60 caliber round ball. Now this properly matches the bore. And this is the group of the proper size ball, ladies and gentlemen. The rifled bore shot, the spiral rifled bore shot, the group into, let's say, a five centimeter circle, which is very close to the 10 ring, which is telling me that it's excellent for hunting and probably with a little adjustment, it could be good for target shooting also, but this is a hunting rifle. The straight rifled bore is also quite good. I have two shots that are very close to each other and another one, which I did not consider a flyer because I thought it was a good shot, which means that probably this is the group that the straight rifling is capable of at 50 meters, but it is still okay for hunting. So you have that second shot whenever you need it. Don't forget that uh, probably the second bore was, uh, was, uh, was, was, was applied for, for dangerous game. So when you have to shoot that wide bore or bear, the second shot will be much closer than the the target range of the first one, which means that it will be still okay. Good. Now this story is really probably not true because he remained a supplier for the military. And in fact, his Lorenz rifles, infantry rifles and Lorenz Jäger Stützens are the best quality military arms that you can get if you're searching for an Austrian military arm. He also made uh, officer braces, officer pistol braces and also made uh, tube lock and percussion ignition guns. So he was really a good supplier of military arms up until his death. Even if the factory was running well in Kirchberg, he did not give up the gun shop in uh, Vienna as well, so he kept on making artisan guns there. He did keep up with the trends, so in the 1860s he presented several break-action breech-loading guns to, to the customers, but he died quite early in 1867. He died on the 29th June and according to his death certificate, the cause of the death was a self-inflicted injury on the neck. So technically, he killed himself. Why he did it? Well, we don't have any information about that so far, but probably because of these rumors. I did not find any more information about how the company continued working, but we know that in 1880 there was a severe fire in the factory, in Kirchberg of course, that contributed a lot to establishing the local firefighting department. The length of the barrel of the rifle is 57.5 cm or 22.6 inches. Although the rifle is a double barreled arm, the weight is not too much, it is only 3600 grams. 
The rifle is beautifully engraved. According to the style and the back action lock, it was made sometime close to the middle of the 19th century. The caliber of the bores is the same 61 caliber. The rifling is quite deep. Based on its profile, it is designed for patched round ball. The twist rate of the spiral rifling is 1 turn in 40 inches, so in fact it is a medium twist rifling. The oiled walnut stock is equipped with a patch box. The rear part of the trigger guard is very European. It is made of horn. The upper spiral rifled bore has a single set trigger system. It is a Rückstecher, as it is called in German. If you push the trigger forward, the trigger pull weight drops significantly. This helps accurate shooting. These locks are equipped with an additional safety. The rifle also has a half cock that allows carrying the rifle capped and loaded, but this little device is better. When it is engaged, the hammer can be released on the nipple, as it cannot reach it, while it protects fully the percussion cap from falling off. Both bolsters are lined with platinum to avoid barrel explosion in case of extreme pressures. The rifle is equipped with a folding rear sight, adjustable for two distances. So we have an upper bore with spiral rifling and the bottom bore with straight rifling. Let's talk about the real purpose of that straight rifling. There are basically two ideas behind it. The first one is related to the usability of the gun, the loadability of the gun. They say that the as the grooves are increasing the inner surface of the bore, the residue of the black powder will settle, will spread on a larger surface, meaning that its depth will be less. Which means that you can shoot more with a straight rifled bore than with the same caliber smooth bore. The other idea behind it is related to accuracy. So first of all, we know that a spinning ball fired from a rifle is very stable. It is much more accurate than a smooth bore gun. Well, but in that time, these double guns were not only used for shooting single projectiles, but multiple projectiles as well, like shot, buckshot, or even buck and ball cartridges. Buck and ball was not really popular on this side of the pond, but buckshot cartridges, they were used. That's absolutely sure. Well, if you shoot buckshot or shot from a rifled, a spiral rifled bore, it will spread a lot. Now, if you shoot it from a smooth bore or shoot it from a normal straight rifled bore, then you will get a much better pattern. Now, the straight rifled bore has a dual purpose. Of course, it will be suitable for shooting multiply projectiles, but it is better for shooting single bore projectiles, patch round bore projectile, than in case of the smooth bore. Smooth bores are inaccurate if you load them with loose powder and patch round bore. Well, they can reach a certain accuracy at 50, 60 yards, but after that, it will lose accuracy. Now, the straight rifled bore is an intermediate solution. It will shoot quite well the single balls and it will shoot well the multiply projectiles. Now this is something we have to try, how about it? The charge here is the same 80 grains of 2F Swiss powder choked with a feldwed. On top of the feldwed I loaded 9 30 caliber buckshots in both bores and closed it with another tight fitting feldwed. The distance to the target is 30 meters.
Let's check it. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, why we need the straight rifling, because the back shot from the normal rifle or with the spiral rifling, well, the hits I have here is, uh, uh, let me calculate, nah. while with the other bore, out of the nine back shots I have, one, two, three, four, five, six in the target, which means that it is effective. <laughs> That's a good experiment. In my opinion, this increased accuracy compared to a smooth bore is caused by the grooves themselves. So when you fire a patch round ball or a, or a naked round ball from a smooth bore gun, you never know on which side the gases will blow out and, and where you have a gap and when it will touch the bore. But in case of a tight fitting patch round ball in a straight right foot bore, now the grooves will just stabilize the gases, they will evenly divide the gases on the sides of the bullet and probably they will stabilize the bullet more. Now these guns are true arts. They mark an age where hunting was completely different than what we do today. The hunter had much limited possibilities for killing the game from a long distance, so had to be much more skilled in hunting, had to know much more the area, the game, everything to be successful. Now this elegant gun is the child of that elegant era. Birko was one of the most important gun makers in Austria in the middle of the 19th century, but still he was not able to become a large-scale factory. And the reason is quite simple. Birko was good in artisan gun making, but his facilities, those two little buildings in Kirchberg, they were not enough for making thousands of guns for the army. And the army by this time was changing from muzzle loading to breech loading, which was a great challenge for the gun makers. Probably Birko could accept that challenge, but he died in 1867 when actually this process started. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in. You've been watching the Cap Amber YouTube channel. If you like what I do, then subscribe, share, comment, like, help us grow because the search engines are not on our side. We are offering you exclusive content on patreon.com slash capandball. You can support us here. I'm very grateful for that. But we are also present on the History of Weapons and War platform. Tune in, log in, and support us there if it is more convenient for you. Ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.